Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. In part three of Can Bitcoin Reach $1 million, I want to discuss Metcalf's Law and the exponential value that can be derived from a network as the number of users increases. So I've spoken about Bitcoin as a store of value a lot and a medium of exchange, all the other reasons why I'm so bullish on Bitcoin. So check out part one and two if you haven't already. But let's dive in and take a look at this idea of parking money as a store of value compared to inflation rates and the rates that central banks print money. So recently we've had interest rates near zero and central banks are saying, look, we want an inflation rate of around two or 3% and that represents a number of things um, you know, demographics and new population growth, wage increases, the economy expanding. I don't want to go into all of that today, but you just need to be aware that central banks are literally saying we want to print around 2 or 3% more money every year, and that represents healthy growth. Now, if you're not getting the value of your assets go up at that rate, or you're not getting a wage increase of 2 or 3% each year, your purchasing power is gradually being eroded. And we see this very clearly in images like this over time. So investors around the world, they're seeking returns greater than this number. And we can see real estate growing, gold, equity markets, whatever it is, these annual growth rates are far higher than that 2 or 3% mark. Now, when these money managers talk about their target rate, they really want to get these growth rates of 7 to 9% a year. An investor isn't aiming to get 2% a year. They feel that if they were to get that 2%, that they're actually falling behind. So they're aiming much, much higher with their returns. And this is also seen in websites like shadowstats.com. So these guys calculate inflation the way that it used to be measured rather than these newfangled statistics where if a can of Coke decreases in size, that doesn't count as inflation, even if you're getting less uh, for the for the dollars that you pay for it. So all those sort of things these days are very much fudged. And John Williams does some great work. Check out this website. But his alternative measures of inflation suggest that, yeah, it's a lot higher. You know, 5, 6, 7% is the actual inflation rate. So again, if you're not getting that, you're losing purchasing power. And then we see things like wealth inequality has never been wider. So the rich are getting richer. They own all these assets that are going up at 7 or 9% a year. And the average guy on average wage is not getting a wage increase every year at all. He might have not had a wage increase for 10 years. And every year he's falling 7% further behind, 2% if you want to go by the official measures. doesn't really matter, but you're falling behind and that's what can drive wage inequality. So that brings us to Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin for the first time is a digitally scarce asset that can't be you know, copied and pasted and just create more like we can with a digital song file, for example. So the fact that Bitcoin has this block reward that decreases over time means that that infl inflation rate increases every uh, four years. So at the moment, it's 3.8% annual inflation. And we know that that new block reward is around the corner in 2020. And that'll reduce the inflation rate of Bitcoin to 1.8%. Now, there's a number of Bitcoins that have been lost. I've spoken about all that sort of thing in the previous episodes. So again, check those out if you haven't already. So here we are a little bit further along than this arrow now at time of recording in 2018. And there's that block reward. And this just steps down every four years, guys until we get to this point where Bitcoin is well under 1% in terms of its inflation. Now, if Bitcoin is inflating anywhere under that 2 or 3% or 7 or 9% um, shadow stats figures, it is comparatively a deflationary asset. So a lot of this becomes very attractive to park money in compared to something that's inflating away and there's always more in supply like fiat money. So why do people park money in these other assets? Do people think that art is necessarily a good investment and a dividend yield producing asset and all that sort of thing? Well, not really. A lot of the time they're parking money somewhere because they have to. They don't want to just sit it in dollars. They might not be comfortable with keeping it in a bank. They might not even have a trusted banking system in their country. There's a number of reasons why people look to park money in other assets these days. And the global art market in 2017, $64 billion. That's just one example of objects that people put money in. You know, diamonds, we've spoken about the gold market being valued at $7 trillion. There's so many things that people 
find value in and want to store wealth in that I believe Bitcoin can easily start to capture. So here's the value of the stock market, $69 trillion, all the stock markets globally, and a lot of these stocks have money parked in them from retirement funds, hedge funds. They have to look for places to park this money, all these trillions of dollars sloshing around the world. It needs to find a home because people aren't just comfortable sitting in cash, particularly when they know that they're losing that 2 or 3% reported inflation a year. So this is broad money supply, $80 trillion. What happens when a small percentage of that starts to say, well, hey, we want to park in Bitcoin because we know that that's becoming more scarce versus the banks that are going to continue to print more money and erode our purchasing power. So it's anyone's guess how big the bond market is these days, but over $100 trillion are the estimates. And again, bonds are very low um, dividend paying assets even to the point in the GFC and in Europe since the GFC they have negative yields so why would anyone buy a bond if they know they're going to get a negative yield and get more money back in return it is all because of this argument that we're making in this video that money just has to find a home it has to go somewhere even if they know they're going to lose a little bit of purchasing power it's probably less of a worry than maybe just sitting in cash when central banks are printing money. So we'd rather lose a little bit um, than lose more or invest in these other assets that we're scared can go down in value even more. Now, the real estate market continues to grow. Estimates of over $200 trillion now and residential property makes up 75%. How many people, particularly here in Australia, have these investment properties where they want to park money? We see people coming out of China, using that capital to pump it into real estate just to get money out of the country and so on. So all these assets that are ways for people to park money, this store of wealth angle, Bitcoin can start to compete with that. So since the GFC, central banks were very worried that money would start to pull out of a lot of all these assets and that would be very deflationary and that's their worst nightmare. They don't want prices to go down. They want the, the economy to continue to grow and money to flow around it. So what they did was print a lot of money to the tune of you know $10 trillion and that has gone into assets. We see stock markets, real estate and everything going up to keep that party going, to keep that inflation going. Now, what they're saying here is that we're going to start to unwind our balance sheets and sell a lot of these assets, but I just don't think there's going to be a buyer on the other side of this. It's all well and good to push these markets up with the money you printed out of thin air, but where is that $10 trillion to buy off the central banks going to come from if people are fearful that they were the buyer of last resort and they're no longer buying? So this has to uh, unwind to some degree, and I think that can be very deflationary. Um, but again, that's just my take. The other thing that all that money printing allowed for was speculation and just money has just pumped into derivatives with the low end estimates being around 630 trillion and over one quadrillion on the high end. And again, when people are fearful that the stock markets, ETFs, all these things are going to unwind, then all those derivatives that are built on top of those, they need to unwind as well. So again, this is all very um, deflationary and people are going to want to park money in things that aren't going to unwind as all this money comes out of the system. So that brings us to the next part about Metcalfe's Law, uh, the number of connected users giving the, the value to that system. We see here, you know, with two connections, um, with two people, we have one connection. Once we get up to five users, we have 10 connections. Once we get up to 12 users, we have 66 connections. And you can see this uh, in this chart where the gradient of the curve starts to increase. We have exponential growth the more users we have. But the cost to run the network and expand stays pretty linear. You know, if one more person buys a computer, they pay the same amount as the last person, but it gives that network. Uh, more value and we really do see this particularly in the tech world so this is the um, statistics for Microsoft Google Yahoo Facebook growth here and we see them take on this hockey stick curve where they just get to this point this critical mass where all of a sudden all their friends are telling their friends at college about Facebook and then it gets out there and we just get this exponential growth so this isn't speculation we've seen this time and time again in the real world and the time that it takes for this to happen is decreasing. We've never lived in a more interconnected world. So it might have taken 25 years for 
PCs and the network growth to really take off. But then we have the internet, uh, Facebook and WhatsApp and once people tell their friends about that, you know, it's instantaneous to message each other and communicate these days. And the time it takes to get to those billion users is forever decreasing. So finally, guys, the number of users that can give this network value is well into the billions. So we're often talking about you know, us in Australia or North America and Europe, those people using um, Bitcoin, but I've spoken about a number of times that I'm really bullish about Africa and Asia where these people are well into the billions in terms of population and the the base number we're coming off of on top of that exponential growth, the value that that would give that network if all these people start to use Bitcoin is what I'm most excited about. So if we have a look at this uh, logarithmic regression, so this is the price of Bitcoin uh, chart in log scale, so it goes up in a factor of, of 10 rather than linear growth. And this has held true for Bitcoin. And here we are uh, right around $10,000. Now we have pulled back, but we've seen that a number of times in the past where the Bitcoin price pulls back below this line, but then it plays catches, catch up and even extends um, to the upside. So can Bitcoin get back to $20,000 at the end of this year? It doesn't really matter, but we are on target to reach $40,000 at the end of 2019, you know, $76,000 at the end of 2020 after we've had the next halvening. And you can extend these numbers out. This would give us a $1 million Bitcoin around 2026, um, all things remaining equal. Again, we can pull back and then catch up. This is not a perfect measure, but hopefully you've seen today with these arguments that Bitcoin has a number of things working in its favor. It might have billions of dollars flow into it, but at the same time, it's those billions of users that I'm most excited about that's going to give this network tremendous value going forward. I hope you've enjoyed this video, guys. Please hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, share these videos around, and thanks for tuning in. Cheers.